Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates ideas that are usually either very old, very new, or very esoteric. So if you follow along in new ideas in science, it's likely that you've been hearing about plasma, plasmoids, or ball lightning and their related phenomena, maybe quite a bit lately. Although most physicists are at least aware of the existence of structured plasma-related phenomena, and there have been a number of experiments on plasmoids or ball lightning, and papers concerning them published over the decades, plasmoids and plasma in general are still too often overlooked, ignored, or even dismissed subjects within general institutional physics and related fields of academia. And this has been quite apparent uh, by the initial confusion and the slow adoption of Malcolm Bendel's thunderstorm generator a retrofit for combustion engines and other fossil fuel systems, uh, which converts the exhaust waste stream to pure oxygen uh, through the means of ball lightning produced by a water bubble cavitation. And so we find ourselves in this quite strange situation where although plasmoids or ball lightning are empirically evident phenomena that have been reasonably well studied and documented, there are still a host of intelligent, well-read people out there uh, studying or working in closely related areas of science, who have been completely unaware that, that structured plasma is even uh, really a thing that's being studied. Because these ideas haven't been adopted widely into mainstream academic study, the different terminology used over the years by different people who believe they were discovering a new phenomena hasn't really been standardized or agreed upon yet. So let's start by defining and differentiating a few basic terms as they've come up recently and how scientists are beginning to use them. The term plasmoid itself is actually very broad. Uh, it's an umbrella term. It essentially refers to a structured field. And physicists are rarely able to define what a field is, uh, only generally what it does. But a field is a conjugate magnetodielectric toroidal hyperboloidal plasma structure, or a perturbation within the unified plasma field, uh, what's often referred to as the ether. And I'm paraphrasing and perhaps dumbing it down quite a lot, uh, even still, but I credit Ken Wheeler for uh, being the first to be able to explain this in a way that's comprehensible. So go check out his uh, channel, which I'll link to in the description if you want to find more out about that. But what Malcolm Bendel calls a plasmoid is what we commonly refer to as a field, and so we'll get more into that later. Then there's ball lightning or Shamir plasmoids. And in the context of technology, these are the plasmoids produced from water bubble cavitation. And it's very important to differentiate between plasmoids produced in water, uh, which we're now beginning to more cohesively refer to as ball lightning uh, within the wider scientific community, and plasmoids produced in air. Small plasmoids produced in air are essentially static electricity, so rogue fields, pockets of explosive energy, so to speak. And these can be certainly dangerous um, and worth being wary of. If you've ever lived under a power line or experimented with high voltage coils, um, you'll know what I mean. There are serious long-term health risks to close exposure to some of these kinds of AC fields. And this is why it's important to differentiate um, which plasmoids we're talking about. And that's something that I'll also endeavor to continue to improve upon in my videos because I've possibly been vague as I've been studying this, um, but I'm learning more. And so I'll be sure to be more clear about terminology now that that's being established. So the plasmoids that are being produced in the thunderstorm generator are Shamir plasmoids, or ball lightning. They're still conjugate field structures, but a totally different kettle of fish, um, because they're produced via water bubble cavitation. They're implosive and safe, at least within the context of the thunderstorm generator. And the reactions are being utilized by and contained within the system uh, without detectable residues or emissions of any concern. So in this video, we're going to try and break down and answer several important questions about plasmoids and the thunderstorm generator in general, and give a bit of a broad introduction to what it all means now that the dust is settling and more and more people are trying to get their heads around the fundamentals of what all of this is. So the first question is, what is ball lightning and how does it function in the context of Malcolm Bendel's thunderstorm generator, which we've been covering a lot on the channel? And the second, how does a thunderstorm work? both as observed in natural systems, and how these natural systems are replicated in the context of the thunderstorm generator. And the third, what are plasmoids on a broader level outside of how they're utilized in the technology? 
And this is a difficult subject to bridge, uh, but we need to talk about it because in reality, everything appears to be a plasmoid, including you and me and our sun and our universe. The universe we are part of is conscious and fractal and consists primarily of structured plasma, but we'll talk about that later. So let's begin at the beginning. What is ball lightning? The stable, waterborne Shamira plasmoids that we see utilized in the thunderstorm generated technology. Well, actually, before we get to that, what is plasma? Um, so plasma is known as the fourth state of matter, and prob you probably already know this, but we're going to go from the beginning. We have solid, liquid, gas, and then plasma. So essentially, there's no such thing as empty space in our universe. So what occupies the area between the solids and the liquids and the gases? What is space made of? And we could call it dark matter, but it has a much more appropriate and accurate name, and this is plasma. It's a medium, just like water or air, but a finer, more subtle medium of a higher frequency. And these are descriptive terms. They may not necessarily be um, scientifically precise, but they do describe what is happening here. Our universe consists purely of energy in different states. So we're generally focused on the denser states of energy that we're able to readily touch and perceive. A uh, matter like water, wood, stone, um, the carbon and the elements which make up the physical human body. So we often observe matter in this fourth state of plasma too, uh, but we can really explain it to satisfaction in layman's terms. So I'll, I'll give it my best shot. When we see electricity arc from exposed wires or a spark gap, this is excited plasma. The moving tendrils of indigo light within the glass sphere of the plasma globe, this is plasma. Lightning, plasma. The great structured clouds suspending dust uh, surrounding the earth, these are plasma. Our atmosphere is actually only a layer of air trapped within a greater onion-like jellyfish of plasma surrounding what we commonly think of as the Earth. The, fla the uh, flame of a candle, incandescent particles of carbon soot suspended in plasma, and the sun also made of plasma. A plasmoid is simply a structured toroid of plasma. In other words, a donut-shaped structure of plasma. So why a toroid or a donut shape? This is the sacred geometry of what we refer to as a field, or sometimes toroidal field or magnetic field. Although the term magnetic field, as it's generally used, doesn't cover the full scope of what I mean here. As we'll discuss later, the toroid is the form which we find that all fields take on all scales of our fractal reality. It's often left to undefine what a field actually is, although the word is thrown around often enough. Um, but let's define a field to be a toroidal structure consisting fundamentally of plasma, matter in its so-called cold fourth state. The toroid is the inverse of the hyperboloid, uh, which is more commonly known as the hourglass shape. And this is where the real secret of the toroidal field, or the plasmoid, lies. The hourglass shape actually consists of two opposing vortexes of plasma. An imploding, centripetally converging vortex occurring at what we refer to as the South Pole, and an exploding, centrifugally diverging vortex occurring, occurring at what we refer to as the North Pole. At the center of the harmonized geometric structure of a Shamir plasmoid, or a ball lightning structure, the waterborne plasmoids utilized within the thunderstorm generator lies the zero point, situated on the plane of inertia between the polarized vortexes. On the imploding south side of the zero point is the so-called gravity well. Matter accelerates towards the zero point and is deconstructed and compressed as it comes into the field of influence of this vortex. And this is sometimes referred to as the white hole of the wormhole or the zero point. Matter is just energy at a low frequency, and when it passes through the zero point, it's stripped of frequency entirely. The potential energy is not lost, though. The structured plasmoid toroid takes on this deconstructed direct current energy and uses it to grow its own body of plasma. Ball lightning can increase dramatically in size instantaneously, uh, although in the context of the thunderstorm generator, they're still very small structures, uh, even after increasing in size, just a few millimeters in diameter. On the exploding northern vortex of the zero point, the side we commonly refer to as the black hole, any, any energy that has gone unutilized by the plasma toroid is ejected in the form of free protons and electrons, keeping in mind that this particle-based terminology is ultimately insufficient to explain the true nature of energy and the non-Cartesian nature of fields. Regardless, though, these building blocks, which we refer to as free protons and electrons, reform into other elements. Uh, what elements reform depends on the elements initially involved in the reaction, 
uh, how much energy or how many protons are available and the nature of the reaction. In the case of the thunderstorm generator, these free protons and electrons reform to a large degree into oxygen, as we have observed in the gas analyzer results a number of times now. Although as shown in the recent SEM sessions from Bob Grainier of uh, Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, there are other synthesized elements and geometries present that plasmoids typically produce uh, as a waste product, such as sulfur and calcium and the crenellated iron and oxygen spheres, which are the magnetic core of the ball lightning structure. So far, I've given a simplistic, perfunctory explanation, though. Really, plasmoids are not made from plasma. Plasma is made from plasmoids. The toroidal plasma structures, or ball lightning produced via water cavitation we're observing in the thunderstorm generator, were actually fractal clusters of smaller plasma tori, which formed to create larger toroidal structures. Tiny, minuscule plasmoids are actually not difficult to make. Um, you can just rub your hands together for a while or pat your soft cap. And those little pinpricks you feel between your hands are tiny plasmoids forming to equalize the energetic differential you've created between the two surfaces. But it's these waterborne plasmoids, um, larger, stable, fractal clusters of small plasma tori that are utilized in the thunderstorm generator uh, that are generally considered more difficult to generate and which are more useful to us and safer to use in technology. So larger stable charge clusters, ball lightning structures, have traditionally required high energy reactions like uh, nuclear or an extremely high voltage power input to generate. Malcolm's thunderstorm generator, the reason why I consider it revolutionary and other people are as well, uh, is because it's producing these large stable fractal charge clusters of ball lightning quite reliably uh, using relatively a very low energy reaction. And this is due to the harmonic ratios and geometry employed in the design. And you can check out my DIY build guide video if you want all of the practical design details on that. And there'll be more coming on that as well. Again, the fact that ratios, angles, and geometry are such a fundamental and important aspect of the design of the Thunderstorm Generator has proved as a surprisingly contentious point in the public realm uh, as this has got out there. But in my opinion, this shows an unusual cognitive dissonance about the current technology that we use on a daily basis. I mean, have you ever considered why an electrical coil is shaped as it is? If it was just a straight wire, would it produce the same type of field or the same result? Uh, why is an antenna shaped with a point and a receiver shaped as a dish? This is basic geometry. Why is the cavity of a combustion chamber of an engine built to a specific size? Or why is a flute made of a specific length of wood or a metal tube? or the neck of a guitar may do a certain length. Why do we design buildings and bridges to ensure they don't resonate in sympathy with any nearby naturally resonating sources? Um, the famous example of that being the methodically synchronized march of many people across a bridge. Um, the bridge began to wobble like jelly as the structure came into resonance with the rhythm of their combined steps. But clearly geometry and sympathetic resonance matters in all considerations of design. It can't be ignored. So consider for a moment that Tesla had not invented the electrical coil and the LC circuit design that became the father of our modern transformers and of our electrical grid. If we had no idea of the tenets of basic coil construction and electrical engineering yet, we may claim that coiling a length of copper wire up shouldn't make much of a difference to just running a current through a straight length of copper wire. But thankfully Tesla showed that shaping the wire into a coil form does indeed produce a very different result, and our AC electrical system was born. Still today, I've heard experienced and respected electrical engineers claim that the geometry of a coil uh, doesn't matter, and that the length of wire, the coil's tuning, and the materials of the coil that the coil are built from um, are the only important factors at play. And again, this is completely outdated and an incorrect understanding of how coils work and uh, of the fields they produce. The geometry of the coil most certainly does change the results, uh, hence the unusual phenomena displayed by the toroidal rodent coils, or any form of toroidal coil for that matter. And it's a little bit the same situation with the thunderstorm generator. Uh, ball lightning is a well-documented phenomena. Uh, you can look no further than the published work of Bob Grainier um, and his work with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, and you'll find a host of references to previous experiments and papers, and there seems to be more added every time I check. Um, so he's a great source if you're looking for more information about this. And I also highly recommend the work of Dr. Robert Temple, and in particular his book, 
the new science of heaven, which deals specifically with ball lightning and other plasma phenomena. Uh, and he references a number of highly credentialed physicists, astrophysicists, and a broad range of other researchers in the related fields of science. But anyway, according to Malcolm, uh, ball lightning structures are produced reliably and prolifically within the thunderstorm generator because of the harmonic geometry employed in its design. Like a musical instrument, the nested sphere and the tube apparatus are tuned to specific ratios to produce the correct harmony. The methodical rhythm of the vacuum and the release actions of the engine's pistons is also taken advantage of by the retrofit to initially cause ionized water bubbles to symmetrically implode before the final reaction within the thunderstorm generator occurs. And I have a number of videos regarding the importance of Sanskrit, alien, and vortex-based maths in the design already, so I'm going to leave the mathematics for this video, and suffice to say that correctly tuning the thunderstorm generator by employing sacred geometry and the harmonic dimensions calculated in imperial inches and feet is key to the device functioning as intended. There will be a bunch more on that side uh, of things in my future videos as well. So again, this has been covered in more detail in previous videos, but a quick recap of the process of the generation of uh, Shamir plasmoids or ball lightning structures within the thunderstorm generator. On the vacuum cycle of the engine, air is pulled through an ionization chamber uh, containing a UV light bulb. The ionized air is diffused through a porous air stone and vacuumed up through a body of water where it forms microbubbles. Stainless steel wool further micronizes these ionized bubbles and the tiny bubbles are pulled up to the top of the chamber. When the engine's pistons reverse and the vacuum is released, the tiny bubbles symmetrically implode and the toroidal field structure of the Shamir plasmoid stable ball lightning is formed. And we have thousands of small bubbles forming and collapsing into Shamir plasmoids during each vacuum cycle. And they're vacuumed through then into the thunderstorm generator unit to be utilized in the next part of the process. And this is where we get to the second important concept I wanted to explore in this video, the thunderstorm. And to be honest, a thunderstorm works a lot like a really big plasmoid. And we all probably know how a thunderstorm forms in natural conditions. A small change in air density and temperature where warm, moist air, I um, mean, storms generally form out at sea or close to sea, becomes trapped close to the ocean or the ground uh, below cold, dry air above. The air becomes highly unstable and a huge voltage potential becomes manifest between the differ differential of the polarized masses of air. The warm, moist air and cold, dry air wants to trade places um, until they equalize this differential, and they want to do this as fast as they possibly can. Think of water draining down a plug hole. Um, the water and the air will trade places as fast as they can while still following the path of least resistance of the polarized vortexes. But the air and the water don't just want to trade places by moving in straight lines, just like the plug hole. Uh, they move as two great opposing vortexes. An enormous amount of energy is now in motion in the form of vortex, and the hurricane is sustained through its intended function to equalize the differential between the bodies of cold, dry, and warm, moist air. These natural phenomena generate millions of megawatts of power as they accelerate, enough to destroy great cities as they have done many times throughout history. We often think of power in terms of how our phone batteries work. Uh, the battery is 30% full, as if it were a glass of water. But power is generated and stored by creating a differential between two differently charged materials or substances. In the case of the relatively more recent precursor to the modern battery, the so-called Baghdad battery, or um, same in the case of the modern supercapacitor, the differentials created by using two dissimilar materials for the plates. One side is positively charged, uh, for example the material could be a metal like aluminium, and the other side is negatively charged, it could be for example a material like graphene or activated carbon. A semiconductor, an electrolytic material such as oil, silicon, or even plain old air or salt water, is placed between the two plates and the polarized plates will interact with each other through the semiconductive region. I believe these concepts were demonstrated quite clearly in form and function by Wilhelm Reich uh, and I suggest looking further into his largely suppressed body of writing about his experiments with what he called orgone, um, another more esoteric name Reich invented himself for the phenomena he observed at the time, which we now know more commonly as ball lightning. So power is generated and stored by creating some kind of differential. 
And whether this differential is formed between the positively and negatively charged materials used as two plates or materials of a capacitor, or between the bottom or the top and the top of a waterfall, um, or by a rapid change of air mass out at sea, or by a cold stream of Shamir plasmoids and water vapor opposing the hot carbon gas exhaust output of an engine. Um, the thunderstorm generator is this simple, just uses the same concept. On one end, the cold stream of structured ball lightning and water vapor are vacuumed into the southern 3-inch sphere, and the cavity of the 3-inch sphere and the inner 2-inch sphere that's been used in some of the more recent prototypes acts as a flow guide for this cold stream of vapor and ball lightning to enter the connected inner nested pipe as a clockwise rotating vortex. On the other end, the hot exhaust gases are directed at an angle into the cavity of the outer 4-inch sphere. The inner 3-inch sphere acts as a flow guide for this hot exhaust stream, and it's directed into the connected outer pipe as a counterclockwise rotating vortex. Although the two opposing vortexes are separated by the walls of the metal pipe, ball lightning are homeostatic self-contained entities, so it's well established that they're able to move through and interact through solid metal. So the thunderstorm is created, and it's a great plasmoid itself, two opposing vortexes with a plane of inertia where they meet. A shear is created, and matter, in this case the carbon in the exhaust stream, is torn apart and deconstructed. But our small ball lining structures, generated earlier, also work to create ionized paths between the inner and outer nested spheres and pipes, attempting to equalize the extreme differentials in temperature and opposing force causing a large part of the reaction and the transmutation of carbon to oxygen. The evidence of which we've seen in Bob Grainier's recent analysis of the cutout from the eight-year-old sphere from one of uh, Malcolm Bendel's original prototypes. The millions of polygonal pockmarks found on the inside of the outside sphere and the outside of the inside sphere show the extent to which the ball lightning is acting within the system. If the outside sphere were glass rather than metal, uh, we'd see an effect much like what we see in the plasma globe, uh, the novelty item that was popular in the 80s, which was originally invented by Nikola Tesla. Essentially, what should be a really low energy reaction, considering our only power source here is a standard combustion engine, creates a very high energy result. Instead of the composition of the final exhaust stream being ejected from the retrofit, being a typical mix of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrocarbons, the final exhaust stream consists, consists primarily of oxygen, with the noble gases nitrogen and argon at atmospheric levels. Essentially, the final exhaust stream comes out as normal air, uh, with only generally a very small percentage of carbon dioxide still remaining, if that. Due to the turbulence created by the small ball lightning reactions and the greater plasmoid of the thunderstorm formed in the retrofit, the carbon material is torn apart. It passes through the zero point of the thunderstorm and the ball lightning structures, and it's deconstructed back into direct current energy without frequency. Any energy excess to what's absorbed by the plasma structures to feed and expand their own plasma bodies is ejected, and these free protons freeform primarily as oxygen, uh, in this case, as the analysis shows, but also with traces of other abundant base elements like hydrogen, aluminium, silica, calcium, sulfur, and potentially amorphous carbon materials, among other things, left as byproducts within the unit. And again, see the work of Bob Grainier or my previous videos for more depth on that topic. So the negatively charged plasmoids themselves also act as a fuel source. When they're vacuumed into the air intake of the engine, they're ignited by the positive plasma burst from the spark plugs, just like the fuel, and they'll combust along with the usual fuel and air mixture. Increases of fuel efficiency ranging from 13 to 40% under load have been achieved, just by adding the retrofit to standard combustion engines due to the addition of the fuel source of the ball lightning and the resulting byproducts formed during the reactions, such as hydrogen and increased oxygen. However, it's the transmutation that's occurring within the retrofit that is the most significant thing to note, and it's been the focus of most of the initial trials we've seen so far. So as we noted earlier, transmuting carbon into oxygen or any element into any other element at an atomic level is typically considered a really seriously high energy reaction, um, generally nuclear or very high voltage. So relatively speaking, they're using an incredibly low energy input here, a standard combustion engine, and also utilizing very low temperatures, just around 300 to 400 degrees output from the hot exhaust side of the thunderstorm, 
and what begins as room temperature air and water to form the ball lightning and the opposing cold vortex of the thunderstorm. And yet here we are, uh, evidentially achieving the transmutation of carbon to oxygen. Low energy import, vortex fusion technology, um, that's all there is to it. Thunderstorms and ball lightning. Shamir plasmoids produced via water bubble cavitation. If we know how to manifest and control these forces of nature using geometry and frequency, we know how to convert matter to energy and energy to matter, enabling us to easily transmute the elements at an atomic level in the future. But what we've discussed so far is a very limited explanation of what plasmoids truly are in their full scope. For a start, plasmoids, toroidal field structures of plasma, including the water-generated Shamir kind, express behavior which suggests they are conscious entities. They are a simple elemental consciousness, certainly, uh, and they act much in the same way that bees or ants do. They automatically act to create balance within the greater system which they find themselves in. An excellent example of this is how they act to create ionized paths for lightning to discharge between the earth and the sky during a thunderstorm. Plasmoids act to keep their environment in homeostasis. They regulate between differentials of positive and negative charge. But they don't act entirely automatically. They can interact with each other and with humans and other entities. Malcolm Bendel told me a story not long after I met him uh, that he once started communicating mentally with the Shamir plasmoids within the thunderstorm generator while it was running. And all of a sudden, the exhaust gas analysis, which had previously been showing a high oxygen percentage with practically no carbon, was back to a typical exhaust gas analysis with normal levels of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrocarbons. And while Malcolm was communicating with the Shamir plasmoids in the system, they'd ceased doing their work. And when he saw what was happening, Malcolm ceased communicating and the readings returned to normal, with the exhaust gas analysis reading as primarily converted oxygen again. If you haven't heard many plasmoid stories yet, this sounds pretty out there to say the least, I know. Then again, maybe if you've been working in quantum physics or AI, you may not think so. But there are a lot of other stories about plasmoids or ball lightning, as they're also referred to uh, sometimes interchangeably, although it's important to note the differentiation we spoke about earlier, but acting with apparent consciousness. It is, in fact, a commonly recorded phenomena throughout history and modern times. Many of the sightings of UFO phenomena or angels or spirits of light appearing to people match the description of large, stable plasmoids. The sightings of these glowing spheres or toroids of light are prolific, as a quick YouTube or Google search should show you. You may have seen, even seen one yourself uh, or know someone who has. The accounts often tell a similar description. The spheres of light moved as though not affected by surrounding conditions such as wind or resistance. They could move through walls and solid objects too. And they're said to have often communicated telepathically with humans sometimes offering advanced knowledge or spiritual advice. So we're currently hearing many whistleblowers from the US military talk about their experiences sighting these glowing orbs that move in unusual ways, and it's becoming common knowledge that this is a real phenomena, uh, even to those who've not personally witnessed such a phenomena. Now this is where we come to the most complicated part of plasmoids that there is to understand, although I've hinted at it a little bit, and this is that we are plasmoids too. The plants and animals and insects are plasmoids, the microbes and fungi are plasmoids, the atom is a plasmoid, the plunk is a plasmoid, the earth is a plasmoid, the sun is a plasmoid, and all the planets and all the stars are plasmoids. Our galaxy is a plasmoid and our universe is a plasmoid. And all of these plasmoids are fractal and they're made up of many smaller plasmoids and it goes on forever. In some traditional spiritual paths, uh, our plasmoid body has been referred to as the subtle body or the astral body, while our physical body, which we've often associated more strongly with as the self, is referred to as the gross or material body. And this energetic aspect of ourselves is also known to scientists, generally as the field or bioplasmic field. Most traditional systems of Eastern medicine and healing were based on treating this energetic aspect of the body the presumed root cause of disharmony experienced in the physical body. The more recent advancements in modern understanding of the human bioplasmic field should perhaps cause us to question whether ancient medical practitioners knew a whole lot more about the workings of the human body than they're generally accredited with. So are we men made of physical matter or are we plasmoids? 
we're both, I guess. Um, we're plasmoids who've chosen to take on a material body akin to donning a set of clothes for the period of a lifetime. And this probably goes well beyond what you expected to hear from a video about plasmoids and thunderstorms. And it's absolutely up to you uh, whether you want to explore this kind of science from a totally empirical angle or whether you want to acknowledge um, that it does kind of delve into the realm of philosophy and metaphysics, objective metaphysics, um, and that these things kind of become unified. But regardless, if you are a plasmoid, what happens when you die? Uh, are you a shape-shifting energy being, discarding another set of clothing after a very long day? And is there something even beyond our energetic bodies, a true self who hides behind multiple layers? All right, so just a few credits and further references. Um, if you'd like to discover more about plasmoids and plasma physics, I highly recommend the book A New Science of Heaven by Dr. Robert Temple, uh, which I used as a reference many times for this video. There, Robert goes into many of the ideas we've discussed uh, in more depth, referencing numerous physicists, experimenters, and other sources. I also highly recommend the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project YouTube channel, Bob Green is a leading expert in the open source world on plasma physics and ball lightning phenomena, and their channel contains a wealth of knowledge that Bob's gleaned over the years from his practical work and studies on that topic. There are, of course, the notes and lectures from Malcolm Bendel, the inventor of the thunderstorm generator and the pioneer of the plasmoid unification model, uh, available on HowTube and Strike Foundation, their website. And if you've been watching the channel before, uh, you'll know that Malcolm's taught me a lot of what I know in this area, and he's continually inspired me and helped me to learn and document aspects of his work and encouraged me to build on his model with my own calculations and realizations because it's a very broad, large topic. But another source for further investigation I recommend is the book uh, by Ken Wheeler, the, Messing S the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. The third edition is the latest one. Along with uh, Ken's lectures on his YouTube channel, Theoria Apophasis. And I often reference Ken's definitions casually in my videos. Uh, and his model serves as the basis of my understanding of magnetism and electricity. Uh, and I've found that Malcolm often references Ken and um, sends his videos around and stuff as well. So, yeah, we're finding a lot of cohesion um, in the work of Ken Wheeler. And I think it's well worth checking out to understand more about these topics. He can be very esoteric uh, and can explain things very simply, but in a very complex way. Um, but it can help a lot, a lot with this stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. But otherwise, goodbye. See you next time.